Hello again, and welcome back to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Todd Pottle. So, Todd, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Michael. I'm the executive re uh, director of the Ontario eLearning Consortium. So, we're a consortium of 25 school boards in Ontario that kind of span the mass of Ontario. Uh, we have 72 school boards, but we have 25 uh, boards that are members of our uh, organization. And uh, we have uh, public and Catholic boards, we have uh, rural and, uh, and urban boards, we have small and large boards. Uh, but the whole idea is that we uh, collectively, we share our students and we share our e-learning courses and we share our professional development and our best practices, et cetera. I'm also a high school administrator. I'm actually seconded into this position. Uh, previously, I was a, uh, a district e-learning coordinator for a public school board here in Ontario. Um, also an e-teacher and uh, I'm an instructor for Queen's University. And uh, one of the courses that I teach most frequently is a uh, course for teachers who are going to become online teachers. The name of the course is Teaching and Learning Through e-learning. Okay. So now, Todd, you've been a, a school leader yourself in the brick and mortar environment. And in this role, you interact with a lot of brick and mortar school leaders and the brick and mortar environment have experienced a real disruption right now the, for the end of their school year and even into the beginning of next. So what advice would you have for those folks as they start to think about and plan out how they might accommodate their, their staffs and their students um, because of this disruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it has been a dis uh, disruption. Um, I can say that in Ontario, they were positioned very well for this disruption, just given the fact that uh, we had uh, an infrastructure in place. We do have a, uh, a learning management system, a virtual learning environment that's provincially licensed uh, called D12's Bright Space. Uh, we do have a very strong emphasis on, uh, on blended learning in our, in our classes. Um, we do have uh, technology enabled learning teacher contacts, which is one person uh, whose position is paid for by the Ministry of Education and they are at each of our boards and uh, their mandate is to uh, promote the integration of educational technologies into programming. And then our boards, each of our boards has a district e-learning coordinator that looks just after those full blown e-learning courses. So. Listen, you know, in answer to your question, you know, I think that what people want to do is you have to be fair and reasonable in your expectations. Okay, so you need to recognize and accommodate the fact there, that there are variations. Now, we've heard a lot in, you know, in the media and whatnot uh, about access to technology and about access to broadband Internet. And those are huge. But though, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just kind of, you know, scraping the surface. So, you know, obviously they are of utmost importance because without technology and without broadband internet, you're not going to be able to, you know, access your online course and actively engage. But then there's other parts to this to which there's less conversation and that's optimal learning environments. So, you know, do our students, each of our students um, have a space, a dedicated space in their households where, where they're uninterrupted and where there's no distractions and where they can focus on their learning and, you know, and, and, and engage in, with the content and engage with their instructor and engage with other students. And, and so, you know, case in point, I have four kids. I have one who's um, uh, home from university, just finished his third year. So he had just finished up his exams. And I have three other students. I have two that are in high school and another who's in elementary school. And uh, so very fortunate that in our household, they uh, have dedicated workspaces. And so, um, but that's sort of, we can't say that that's consistent across all households throughout Ontario. And we have to recognize that. And, and we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to accommodate it. Uh, there's also supports in the household, you know, so, you know, some uh, students may have a sibling or a parent who's tech savvy, for instance, or maybe somebody who's had experience with online learning. And, and those supports become very helpful. But again, there's huge variation in that. So we're not talking about, you know, a, uh, a level playing field. Um, I'd also say to them, you know, you really need to focus at, during these times on, on what you consider to be the core learning. And so what are the essential skills and knowledge that are kind of, you know, prerequisite for future courses or for future experiences? So, you know, kind of kind of looking you know, very closely um, and very critically, you know, at the content that you're delivering uh, through the lens of, is this essential? 
is this, you know, because, you know, knowing that our students aren't going to be able to experience the same length or depth of learning, you know, in their households as they are in their face-to-face -face environments. So, um, you know, kind of uh, paring down the content uh, towards that, those skills and knowledge that are essential for their future experiences, whether it be in a course or in life in general. Uh, the other part is you need to have remote technical support and, uh, you know, not every household has someone in the house who can, you know, provide the technical support that the students require and, and that becomes extremely important. So I know that uh, in my former board, for instance, or I should say my current board, um, to which my students attend, they have a tech hotline. And so if a student or a parent is having trouble, they can simply call up and uh, they can get immediate technical support. I think that's vital. Most importantly are the mental health supports. You know, regardless of the situation, uh, this, is, this is a new environment for everyone. Everyone is feeling taxed. Everyone is feeling stressed. Everyone is trying to cope with what they have to the best of their abilities. We have to be cognizant of the impact, whether they're flags or not flags, the impact that this is having on our students. And so, you know, not only making those available, but encouraging them that, you know, to, to, to reach out through whatever supports are being offered at the board or at the provincial level uh, to take, you know, to take advantage Advantage of those um, because you know they are anonymous they are available and they can be extremely helpful to students in these situations the last point and I often talk about this when it comes to online learning it's the communication piece right and the connections and so whatever the teachers can do with whatever tools they have available and skill sets they have is to maintain that consistent communication and those connections you know, with them and the students and amongst the class so that so that the students don't all of a sudden think, oh, OK, well, my class is on the computer. Um, it's it's over. You know, it, it's, uh, it's it's so essential that they continue to understand that they are a part of a learning community in order to for them to understand that it's important that the teacher maintain those links, maintain the communication so the students know that they are there in order to support them and also to the best of their abilities maintain the connections within the class itself. So. Now for sure Ontario because of the infrastructure it had was probably better suited than a lot of jurisdictions throughout North America to make this transition but even with that there was still sort of a bit of a shock to the system when it happened this time. Um, what can school leaders do over the coming months and into the next school year so that if a second wave comes through or if there's a local flare up in a particular district that we can make the transition next time a little more seamless? Great question. You know, and there's a lot of learnings that have come out of this experience and, you know, I'll speak to those as they relate to online learning, but they have to continue to level the playing field, you know, as I've already talked about. And, and I truly believe the Ontario Ministry and, and boards and, uh, uh, you know, our health contacts and our DELCs and our e-teachers and, and our teachers and our guidance counselors, et cetera, have done, and our IT departments and our various boards have done an incredible job. So in terms of the deployment of technology, uh, deploying technology to those students who, who require the technology who don't have immediate access and and I'm not talking about you know a household that you know has technology because a household could have two pieces of techno uh, technology that uh, have the ability to access the internet and the ability to manage whatever learning face uh, learning interface is being provided um, but enough for for each student in that you know in that particular household so for instance you know in my household we have four um, so it would be important that each of my children have access, consistent access to the technology that they require so that they're not having to share. Partnering, uh, partnering with internet service uh, partners. Now, the, um, to ensure that, you know, not only are we, do students have technology, but the technology is not very valuable if they don't have internet access. And it's not only to have internet access, but they have to have significant you know, significant bandwidth, particularly if you have a class that's uh, media heavy. There, there may be a lot of video, there may be a lot of, you know, interactives and um, manipulatives. Uh, those types of things require a lot of bandwidth. And so it's very important that we're not only looking at, 
checking the box, yes, I have internet access, but checking the box, yes, I have adequate internet access, provide sufficient bandwidth in order to, uh, you know, to participate in my online course. And so, you know, those, those two things are very important in terms of leveling, leveling the, uh, the playing field. Um, and Ontario's done a great job of that, you know, with their, with their northern initiatives, their northern rural initiatives in terms of uh, getting uh, the provision of, um, of uh, broadband internet into, into these locations so that they are accessible by the community in general, but also, of course, by students. So then this is the preparation piece, right? I mean, this is, you know, had we had time for preparation, I mean, this would have gone a lot more smoothly. Um, and, you know, in terms of our online, our e-learning students, uh, you know, not much of a change because this is kind of what they've been doing as long as they have broadband internet at home uh, and as long as they have technology and as long as they have a suitable place to work from, you know, they were fine. But what about those students though, who just have kind of, maybe a little bit of experience with blended learning or, you know, perhaps in the rare occasion, no experience with blended learning. So, you know, the preparation piece is important. So an orientation, but not an orientation just to the virtual classroom. So not an orientation just to, here's how you use D2L Brightspace, here's how you use um, uh, you know, uh, Canvas, or uh, this is how you use, um, you know, Google Classroom, uh, et cetera. I I'm talking about going beyond just the the virtual classroom itself and the peripheral software that's being used and looking at those essential kind of soft transferable skills so because those become ultimately even more important so how do you manage your time when you're working you know for the for a lot of the time you know independently how do you communicate effectively online you know and the list goes on and on in terms of those kind of essential soft skills that are transferable but are absolutely essential for success in an online learning environment. Then I would tell leaders, you know, you need to focus. And so what you wanna focus on is, how do we replicate the rich experiences of a regular school day? You're not gonna replace them because you know, that's very difficult to do in a virtual environment. I will say that there are some advantages in a virtual environment over a face-to-face -face classroom, but won't get into that, but there's obviously distinct advantages as well with that regular face-to-face -face interaction with your teacher and your peers. So, but what can we do using the knowledge, skills, and tools that we have to replicate those rich experiences of a regular school day? So what then are those rich experiences? So they're tasks that require students to interact and collaborate with one another. You know, how, do we, how are we going to achieve that in an online environment? Because we don't want our students just learning on an island. We don't want it to be like distance learning in the past correspondence learning where you're basically given the content you know to answer questions and, and to provide it back to see whether or not it's correct we, we, we actually want students to be able to interact and collaborate just the way that they do in their regular class then can we have periodic you know type of synchronous lessons that allow you know direct instruction as well as interaction i mean we have the tools so are we and i'm not saying that every day that a teacher has to get online, whether it's in a Zoom room or whether it's Adobe Connect or whether it's Google Hangouts or, or, or WebEx or whatever, um, or Microsoft Teams. But periodically doing that is important to allow for the direct instruction as well as the interaction. The other part you know, that I often, you know, when I'm training e-teachers is it's very important to have those regular office hours you know, is to not, so that you're not making yourself available all hours, all the time, because that would become unmanageable. But those regular office hours during the day where students can, or parents can just pick up the phone. Or what I do in my courses is I have a, um, I just have a Zoom room that's open, you know, and, and they can drop in at any time during my office hours in order to converse with me. Uh, so you can do it through phone or through VC, uh, but it's a little more powerful than email to have that, you know, those direct conversations as we are now. And then, you know, start to be creative as many of our e-teachers throughout Ontario have been doing for a lot of years and our blended learning teachers. There's so many opportunities, virtual field trips, bringing in guest speakers remotely. Why not run your spirit days? In fact, my uh, daughter, who's in elementary school, her school is still running their spirit days. So it's kind of been fun for us in the household as well. Another example of doing morning announcements through video. So, uh, you know, another great example of something that could be done. You know, the last thing I'll talk about is the consistency piece. And this is one that's really tripped us up because this is all landed on our doorstep. 
But I would, I would tell leaders, you need to choose a platform and go with it. Because if you, have, if you have all teachers using the same platform, it's going to make it easier for the students who are taking courses that are offered by you know, various teachers. But when you have one teacher using Google Classroom, another one using uh, D2L's Brightspace, another one using Moodle, maybe somebody using Canvas, maybe somebody just using Google Docs, Edsby, whatever, that becomes very, you know, that, that becomes challenging, even more challenging for the learner at the end. And, you know, and, and I guess in, in partnership with that is leverage the expertise of the e-learning and blended learning teachers that are already in your system. Those are going to be by far your most valuable resource. And if you're not calling upon the expertise of the people who are in this business and have the experience, have the training and have the knowledge, then you're really forfeiting a huge opportunity. Uh, these are the people who can uh, help a long way in terms of improving your program, making it less frustrating for your teachers, and at the end, making it more uh, productive and conducive uh, to learning for your students. All right. Well, thank you very much, Todd. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with has been Todd Pottle. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank <laughs> you.